In India, there's currently one billion pads thrown in the landfill every month. My brand and my product was that I didn't want it to look and feel like a period product. I wanted the brand to fit very seamlessly into what any woman would consider to be a cool or relatable brand. I'm having quite a crash course in women's health, I think. Some women still will not say that I'm on my period. They'll use a code word or whatever it is. Thin layer, extra gel, blah, 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 blah. There's like so much stuff to it, right? It's very confusing. A lot of these brands have been created by, by men. The fun for us lies in creating value. Uh, a friend of mine called me and she said, you know, this period underwear is really blowing up in Europe. Why don't you check it out? The reusability aspect of it, do you think it's going to go against you more than for you? This is... Hi, I'm Avisha. I'm the founder of Nushu Period Underwear. Um, and uh, we are looking to solve um, many problems within the menstrual space. One is that the fact that there's a lack of options in the market. There's a lack of comfortable options and a lack of sustainable options as well. Uh, the menstrual industry is a very polluting industry uh, in India as well as uh, in other parts of the world. Uh, we find menstruation is viewed too much as a woman's weakness and we are trying to shift that narrative to, um, you know, uh, shift the perspective of seeing it as a woman's strength and society's strength as well. Lovely. So, in fact, this has coincidentally fallen on a very topical note. I have and we have been speaking to a fair few people who are involved in this field. In fact, we recorded with Anahat just yesterday. So, and we spoke to Sanjana of the Pink Box today. So, I was talking to a friend of mine and I was like, you know, I'm having quite a crash course in women's health, I think. Yeah, we even, we even had a very brief talk with Sempower and just three days back. So I think it's been one after the other. So we, I think both of us have had a very, uh, so what, yeah, I think crash course in uh, women's health is a good way to put it. But uh, Avisha, wh why in your opinion is this something that's not talked about, that's not made aware? And why do we as a species, I would say pretty much not really speak about this? So I think um, it started with good intention. Uh, let's, you know, rewind uh, 100 plus years when women were part of the labor force in some sense, you know, even if it was domestic labor. Um, the whole, um, when a woman is on her period is when your body is completely zapped of energy, you're really exhausted, your body is taking a toll on you. And all of the taboo, like let's say restrictions, uh, started then. You know, the temp, like not be not going to the temple, being kind of isolated within your own home, not being able to enter the kitchen. These kinds of restrictions were brought about to give the woman to force rest upon the woman, um, so that you know she can really uh, rest and recuperate um, when her body is really requiring. I think what happened along the way is that these uh, good intentioned um, ideas got sort of um, manipulated um, along the way. And uh, I guess, you know, um, the world and the, the rising patriarchy perhaps twisted it in a way to kind of display it as a weakness um, and as something that's impure um, and something we shouldn't really talk about. Uh, and I think now there's a huge turning point that's happening um, in the last, I would say, five plus years. Uh, and, you know, people are talking more about it. People are very interested to, uh, and I'm, when I say people, I mean not just women, but even even men um, and boys, teenage boys as well. They're all very interested to know what goes on because it clearly is something that has such a huge impact on a woman's life, her mood her energy, um, and I think learning about it shines more light upon uh, menstruation and women's health 
And as a result, we can all live in better wellness by just being more aware and more educated about the topic. I feel on the men's front, when you see your counterpart, you know, on a monthly basis, when you see them suffer, when you see them in pain, you also wish to learn what is what exactly is happening with them. No, I was just going to say from a, a male perspective, you know, if you are, if you do have a, um, a, a wife or a girlfriend, it's actually in your best interest to learn about it because then you know when you need to tread lightly. Um, I keep telling my husband, you know, you should be putting my, my cycle in your calendar because I don't want to tell you over and over again when you need to tread lightly. And, you know, it's just we fight a lot more during those days. Um, so just know about it, be aware about it so that, uh, you know, there's less friction uh, during that time. Abisha, I remember when my uh, when I had to go and buy a, a set of pads for my girlfriend the first time, and I remember being very awkward about it because again, conversation had never happened or like the thing had. So, what brought you into this space, and what is the change that you're trying to make? So, um, you know, I used to have a clothing brand, and uh, it was resort wear in a sense, and I always had a giving back model woven into. Um, our our sales. So for every piece sold, we initially started with giving back 10, uh, 10 meals to the homeless. And within a few months, I changed that. And I said, you know, it's a women's brand. I'm someone that's always been very much into women's issues, uh, grown up with a very large sisterhood surrounding me. Um, and so I thought, okay, why don't I switch this giving back model to giving back five pads? For every piece that's sold. So I tied up with a brand in Hong Kong and I said, you know, sell it to me at cost. And, um, you know, this is what I would like to do because and I marketed it as well. Um, I wanted conversation um, to, to people to, to speak about this more and also for there to be awareness about period poverty and how it's actually a luxury to have... Um, you know, period management tools at, at your fingertips. So that is sort of where it all sort of struck from a more professional angle. And then um, the clothing business was going on during COVID. So I was stuck in Hong Kong, which is not a great market for fashion. And I hit a ceiling very quickly. And just around that a similar time, um, uh, a friend of mine called me and she said, you know, this, this period underwear is, really blowing up in in Europe why don't you check it out and so um, uh, I checked it out I, I, I bought a piece and I tried it and it was just for me it was an overnight switch it made me see my period in such a positive light um, it was not something to dispose of and it was the product was just so comfortable you know it was made with premium fabric uh, that can be used for two years so just that in its uh, in itself was um, a big uh, a big push to to start this and really you know hope that this product can help society change the way that they see their period like the way that they see menstruation um, as as a as a subject. I wish to expand on Vishrut's experience. It gets so confusing. You. So in the US, when you enter Target or you enter Walmart, you're not hit with like one brand or two brands or one type or two types or like thin layer, extra gel, blah, 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 blah. There's like so much stuff to it, right? It's very confusing. And you are entering this industry as another one of the add-ons. Right? So I, I wish to understand that a little better. If you do go in as a dude or as a lady and you're there to buy something, what makes it easier? Like wh what should I look for and what should she look for? Um, so, you know, one main distinguisher is whether you want something that you insert inside, which are tampons and cups, or whether it's something that, you know, um, like a pad or now also period, period underwear will be under that category. So that's the first thing um, to determine. And then you have to think about your flow, how heavy is your flow, and what kind of a product do you need to support that. Um, 
then you have to understand your flow and see, you know, what kind of product, what kind of thickness or heaviness you need to support that. It will take a bit of trial and error. Um, and then, you know, you see also the fabrication. What, and that's, that's the crazy thing is that a lot of these fad brands, they don't put the fabrication on, you know, on the packaging. So women are so oblivious to what they're actually using and what kind of chemicals and materials are used in these products that are um, used in a very sensitive part of your body. Um, so I would say, you know, that's definitely something that brands and companies need to do a little bit more is put the, the fabrication um, on very clearly on the packaging. Um, you know, they're more concerned about putting fragrance and this and that and so yeah, it's there is a lot, and they're all very bright colors, and they all are packaged very similarly. Um, but women tend to have a brand that they're loyal to, that they've been using all these years. Uh, so usually she knows what she's going in for. Why I ask you this is because you must have had the same overwhelming experience, right? When you know, the world around you starts changing, and then you come up with this idea, and you come up with the development of this idea. What goes in your mind, right? You are, you are entering a very saturated space and in that space, you're wishing to develop something which is so customized on a person-to-person -person basis. So what goes on in your mind to develop something like that? What kind of customization do you feel that the ladies would look at in order to buy your product? So I think that what made it easy for me to conceptualize my brand and my product was that I didn't want it to look and feel like a period product. I wanted the brand to fit very seamlessly into what any woman would consider to be a cool or a relatable brand. So with that instantly, you know, it, and because I've been in fashion, I was very much like, I just want to create a cool brand, um, you know, with nice colors and nice fonts and I want to be warm and inviting. So it was very gearing away from what period brands what most period brands are like um, uh, today, like for example, I would compare uh, period brands similar to dental care, you know, the, the look and feel of the brand, bright colors, um, quite jarring sort of graphics and imagery. And I really wanted to steer away from that because I think current products in the market are not doing justice to what um, it is to menstruate. And I really wanted to, my whole goal is to shift that narrative uh, completely. So, Avisha, uh, Akhil and I are both a little concerned or I would say a little on edge because we live in an environment where people get offended at the drop of a pig. And both of us guys asking you questions about periods, asking you questions about menstruation, about products, stuff that we have never really been educated about we have learned as we saw or learned as per experience how do you deal with that and you know how do we go about not offending people by asking questions or being inquisitive or trying to understand more you know we don't want to use the wrong words or don't want to use the wrong or don't want to use the wrong tone forget even the words i think even today even tone is enough to put people off and why are why are we uncomfortable right because why why had society built us up to be uncomfortable talking about this stuff? That's another one of the very major topics. Absolutely. You know, it's really deep conditioning. And I'll tell you, I'm someone who's in the industry and I'm a woman. And I would consider myself to be somewhat of a feminist as well. But now I've gotten used to it because I've been seeing it so much. But initially, when people would ask me what I'm doing and even, you know, older relatives of mine there would always be a second where I hesitate. Like, you know, um, now I've gotten used to it and you have some some guys who are very interested and they'll ask a lot of questions and how does it work and, you know, this space really interests me. And then, of course, you have some that are like, oh, okay, cool. Um, you know, and they're not really interested in, uh, you know, getting further into the topic. And I think both are absolutely fine. Um and, you know, even for women, like, some women still will not say that I'm on my period. They'll use a code word or whatever it is. Um, and while I don't think there's anything wrong with that, I do think it's, it is time for a change. 
Um, and I think the change will come from women themselves and then it'll spread to the rest of society as well. Um, so hence, again, I, I, I'll bring it back to my product and, um, you know, the whole, really, this product is to, for a woman to see her period as not something to dispose of, like it's really to normalize it, you know, um, and let it feel like a normal day with a bit of extra exhaustion, which definitely comes along with it. Uh, but yeah, for you to just feel like it's normal. How has your brand been, like, what has the reception been like? How have the have the people liked it? Uh, yeah, so um, we've gotten good feedback. Um, and, uh, you know, for some people, it's a very quick, oh my God, I love it. I cannot go back to using pads. I'm converted, you know, after 12 hours of using it. So we do get feedback like that, which just puts us over the moon. Um, and then we also get feedback like, oh, I like it, but it's going to take me time to get used to it. Um, we get all sorts of feedback, even some girls that say uh, it's great for, you know, for when I sleep um, or it's great for my third day onward. So we get all sorts of feedback. Um, and I think it's so it's different based on a woman's body, on a woman's flow. And it's that's all so unique to the individual. Um, but that's what we think where our product comes in really well is that it can fit into any part of your cycle and it will improve that part in which you're in which you're utilizing it. Since we've spoken so much about the product, let's get a let's get a sales pitch. What is the product? How does it work? And uh, you know, how is it different to a pad or a tampon or what exactly is reusable on period underwear? Great. Well I have some uh, some samples with me which I'll use to describe my pitch. So, this is Nushu reusable period underwear. And this underwear can be used for up to two years. So, you can wash and reuse it. And we have three levels of absorbency we have super heavy, heavy, and medium. And the super heavy one can absorb up to six parts of blood. So, you don't, depending on your flow, you don't have to change in the middle of the day. You can wear this. Change in the evening when you come back home if you feel the need to. Um, and basically the way that it works is that there is um, in, in sort of the crotch area of the underwear, we have a built-in um, padding, absorbent padding, which is comprised of four layers. And the middle layer is made with microfiber, which is like a micro towel um, material that's often used for household cleaning. So it's a very absorbent material. And beneath that layer is a TPU coated layer, which prevents any leakage from happening. So that's where, um, you know, it's uh, like, um, that's how you get uh, a high absorbent capacity. And it's also built to your body size, right? Um, we go off a of body size. So it's not going to move around. Um, it's going to stay very much in shape. And it's a very sort of streamlined product. So that is what, what, it, what it's all about. So, Avisha, you say it lasts for two years. What is the sort of experimentation that goes on? Where does this two-year number come from? Because you mentioned even the European underwear that was recommended to you during COVID that sort of brought you on to this direction was also a two-year you know, lifespan product. So where does this two-year number come from? So we say two years as a general wear and tear um, for any kind of garment that you use um, often, and the also the 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 number of washes as well. We want to make sure that the product is going to function, and also after two years, generally one should refresh their intimate garments um, just to you know um, have a fresh pair and. Kind of, um, we, we say that the life scan, lifespan can be more than two years. Some brands claim three years. Uh, but we say just to have the product at its optimal functionality, we give a two-year shelf life. Okay. So what is the kind of testing involved in it? That's, the kind of, that's what I was trying to get at. So we did a lot of testing with different fabrics, um, especially for our top layer, because that's a layer that's in, in contact with, this, with the skin. 
So we wanted to make sure that remains dry and that it's quickly absorbent as well. So we tested several fabrics for that from Coolmax to, um, you know, to different sort of polyester blend to cotton to merino wool. Um, and we found that we, ours is made with lensing modal, which is the highest quality of modal that you can get. And we found that to be the best option um, because it's super soft and it also is quick dry. Uh, so that's one of the things we tested. And then we also tested with a couple of different factories. Uh, we tested with some domestic factories as well as in China. Um, we did a lot of um, absorbency testing as well to make sure that the product is absorbing what we claim that it's absorbing. Um, we did some tests with fabrication and GSMs, which we sent to the labs to get tested, just so we know exactly the kind of fabrication that is going into the underwear. Um, and then we sampled with a bunch of women. Um, you know, we made them try pieces from different factories. Um, we made them try, um, you know, different fabrication, see what was coming out uh, to be the best results. Got it. Uh, Avisha, you mentioned lensing modal. What is that? So it's a, a company that makes modal. So Tencel as well is under that, um, that same uh, uh, company. So it's a very... Um, what is modal? So modal is a fiber that's made from wood pulp. So it's similar to cotton, but it has slightly softer properties. It also has more quick dry properties. It's kind of like a slightly more elevated um, cotton. It's a lot softer um, as well. So, and Lensing is a company that is constantly innovating in the, the textile space. And uh, Lensing is basically a brand name. Got it. Yeah, as you lost, you, I was wondering what that was supposed to mean. Avisha, it doesn't sound like a very innovative idea. And I'll tell you why I say that, right? Because for babies, we have diapers, which are like underwears with the built-in um, soaking padding thing, right? So why has this not been a thing till now? And why has this just not taken over the industry as a whole? Because... Right now, pads need to be changed. They need to be changed like two times a day for some, in some cases, even more. And then they're really uncomfortable. And then all of this goes on with it. You make it sound like it is a no-brainer. So why has this not been a no-brainer? Why are the big boys in the town not taking over this product and just launching it left, right and center? And why, even after the fact, I think it sounds like a no-brainer more because you just realize that, yeah, this is something that's happening every month for a, well, I think what, for about 35 to 40 years on average, if not more. So when there is this much time and this much, you know, the talk around it, like there's market, demand, you know, everything. If it's such a no-brainer, how come more people are not doing it? Yeah. No, so I, I'm really glad you said this, Akhil, because it is a very easy product to construct. It's not rocket science. Um, it doesn't require any kind of special machinery or anything like that. It's a very simple construction. I think it go. it's similar to um, what I was saying about the taboos and how it's so stigmatized and conditioned. And I think this is exactly... Um, also, it spills into product usage. People are just more comfortable with what they've been using also because it takes so much trust for a woman to change her habit, especially in this space, um, that, you know, it's going to take a lot of education, a lot of testing, um, and a lot of, um, like, fear, um, uh, like, a word of mouth, and, um, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, so like, um, recommendations as well. And why has this product taken so long to come about? You know, if we, again, like rewind back 40, 50 years, if we look at companies like P&G and Kimberly Clark um, that, you know, really are spearheaders in the whole personal hygiene space. Um, funnily enough, a lot of these brands have been created by, by men, you know, and that's why you haven't seen 
um, much innovation in this space as well because women just got so accustomed to using this. Um, and you would, you would never really think that you could create an underwear that could manage to absorb um, your flow and be a comfortable product. Um, so we've had uh, women come to us and say, you know, can this, does this work for teenagers? Um, I, wanna, I want my daughter to use it, but she won't use it but she wants her daughter to use it. She doesn't want her daughter to go through pads, go through the hassle of pads. She would rather put her in an underwear from day one, but the mother herself is still hesitant to, to change and to try it. And that tells you how deep um, conditioning goes, you know, and how deep habits go. Um, and um, yeah, and you know, we also get a lot of, uh, questions and queries about hygiene and uh, people ask us you know back in the day women used to use cloth um, and the switch to pads was for hygiene and for comfort now it's almost this underwear is almost going back to that whole like concept of using cloth um, so there's also that um, that the pads with pads were there to liberate from cloth, from having to wash. And now it's kind of like you're, you're bringing it back. Why? Women were not questioning also, you know. During my, my, my research, um, we would ask, you know, what do you currently use to manage your period? And in India, it's mostly pads. And then we ask, well, have you dealt with the rash? And I kid you not, 70 to 80% of these girls responded, yes. I deal with rashes and still, still they wouldn't question the pad. They still wouldn't say, oh, I need to switch, you know, I need to use something else. I need to find a new innovation, maybe look to the West to see what's going on. They just accepted it. And that goes hand in hand with how menstruation has been a taboo topic. It's kind of like, just deal with it. You know, let, let's just take what you get and that's, it is what it is, sort of a thing. Avisha, since you brought it up, this whole concept of using a cloth and then using reusable underwear. So with the cloth, the basic thing was, you know, you wash it a bunch of times and then it gets diseases on it and like people get diseases thanks to using that, putting that again and again and again. So what in your product is um, ensuring that it is, you know, hygienic to use after washing? Or is there a particular technique to wash it? Or is there a particular way, like, you know, is there a product that has to be used? And I would like to add to that, the one of the petroleum CEOs around 1960s gathered all of these big brands and brought a garbage can with him and said, your future belongs in the garbage can because they were going to launch plastic bags, Right. And the whole concept of use and throw feels a lot more hygienic. It feels a lot more like, you know, I'm using a new thing every time. It's going to be on my body. And then I'm going to discard that thing. Same as with toilet paper, same as with bottles of drinks, right? You, you assume you're using the clean thing. Do you think it is going to be anti-you? A usable, a reusable thing, because pads generally also constitute the whole game of I'm going to use it and throw it. So the reusability aspect of it, do you think it's going to go against you more than for you? What is your feeling on that? I think that is something that will be for me, um, and you know, for the brand and product. And the reason I see this is again just going back to sustainability, going back to reducing your waste. Um, when we think about approaching corporates, we approach them from the angle of sustainability. You know, but when we're approaching a woman, a consumer, we're approaching her from the angle of comfort. So two very different angles, uh, but both are very valid. Um, and I think the sustainability aspect of it will is something that will lift our brand up um, in the eyes of a corporation or an institution um, and uh, you know the reason I say this is because like the in India there's currently 1 billion pads thrown in every month which is a huge number 
and this is not even every single woman in india uses pads so it's a very small chunk of the market and that's the level of pollution that it's creating um so you know i think the the fact that it's reusable will be a, a huge positive uh people will see it in a more positive light um because of that and bishop to answer your um question about cloths and how you know um it was known to sort of cause diseases and what not in using it over and over uh one thing in within our underwear that definitely combats that is the four layer um the four layer construction of the padding so the blood that is gets collected is collected in a middle layer which you which doesn't come into any contact with the skin so that being said it's sort of it's a very concealed um layer and you know the the whole part of it creating diseases and what not it's also very down to how someone uses the product um are they using it in the right way are they washing it in the right way if someone was using cloth they may not have had access to washing it in 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 the right way with detergent um you know giving it a thorough wash so a lot of these things are very speculative um and it also is attached to the idea of um of it being unhygienic you know wearing an underwear uh which is containing your blood all day that's another question we get a lot is it hygienic and the question is really what's unhygienic about it you know at the end of the day the blood that's coming out of you when you're menstruating is actually what's what the lining that nurtures an embryo you know um and that is also again attached to the stigma of um you know a periods being a taboo impure um and so on and so forth so it's a very multi-layer um situation i would say from product to perception um to taboo and uh you know i really hope as a nation we can really start to pick these pick these layers apart and shine more light um on this whole idea of and I'm going to go shamelessly plugging our episode now and say that you know for all those of you who want to hear more on this whole concept of how much of a taboo this is and what people in India are doing check out our previous episode it's with Purvi from Anahat for Change and we have gone very much in depth about all the taboo surrounding periods menstruation and what not so avisha can we get a little bit about you where do you come from how did you go from you know having a clothing brand to this and what led you to getting to the clothing brand what was that all all about can we get a bit about you sure so uh i'm born and brought up in hong kong and um i ended up going to boarding school when i was 15 years old i went to an all girls boarding school in the us so that's sort of where my the feminine side of me came in um and i i've always grown up in a huge family uh both my mom's and dad's side are huge i have around 50 first cousins and that that's not a joke at all um and most of these cousins were women so i was always surrounded by sisters of all ages you know and um that combined with my all girls boarding school experience women's issues were always at a forefront um to me you know um growing up seeing what kind of taboos uh what put around women how my brothers got permission for some things and my sisters didn't all of these things started playing at me and it wasn't sitting well at all and so uh my boarding school gave me a great education um everyone there was a was a feminist more or less and um from there i went on to study in boston i went to bentley university and i got a marketing degree and i was always into fashion from from being a, a little girl and so i pursued further education at parsons and um i always thought um you know a career in fashion was always paved out for me um and i did a couple of different jobs um within the fashion industry i decided to start my own brand um and that brand really did tie in you know craftsmanship in india to sort of making it more accessible and more relatable for the western market um and very funnily i found it very hard to sell clothes you know it just didn't come naturally to me 
I wasn't able to do a sales pitch of why a woman needs another dress in her closet. So I was very sheepish about sales and I was very shy about it. Um, and, um, you know, women's issues always being, always being a part of me really throughout my entire life um, and changing our giving back model to menstruation as well. These things started, started coming more and more to the forefront um, of, my, of my thinking and, you know, what I would want to do in this, in, in, during my lifetime as well. And, um, you know, stumbling upon this product, um, I found it to be a very disruptive product, um, something that can really liberate women um, and also help combat the, the, the waste that's created by the menstrual industry. And the best thing about it is that it's a necessity. And the fact that it's a necessity and can really, um, you know, improve a woman's life, I have no shame in, in selling it. And I really enjoy trying to convince someone uh, to try the product out. So that's how I landed upon here um, and doing it for the Indian market instead of doing it back home in Hong Kong was also a no-brainer because India, one, it's a huge market. Uh, I have roots in India. Um, I have a, a, a feeling of wanting to give back to this country. Um, and I just find it a fascinating market, which I love learning about every day. Avisha, all three of us are boarding school people. And oh yeah, where did you guys go? So I was in the law school Sinar and he was in Singapore. Okay, UWC? Yes, UWC. Okay. And another commonality, Marwadis unite. I also have 51st cousins and yeah, I, I completely <laughs> relate to exactly what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But you guys know what boarding school is like and it really shapes how you think. You know, the people around you and everything. Um, so I think that my education there is really what shaped who I am today and how I see the world and how I think. I feel that time of confinement that schools provide, like when you're at home and you're confined and you're not free and you just, if at that moment a kid is placed in a boarding school, something completely rewires. And the way you see the world changes, the kind of effect your family can have on you changes, the kind of control your family has on you changes, right? And you, you're viewed as an outlier. So when you do, when you plan on doing this, when you say that I'm going to be making women underwear or women pads underwear, right? What was the reaction of your family? And were they up for it? Were they very supportive? And how did it go? All the women in my family were very supportive. <laughs> my mom was super supportive. My nanny was super supportive. Uh, you know, they said it's a great idea. My dad is very much like, um, he is very iffy about India. Um, you know, he finds it a very difficult place to work. So he was kind of struggling with that idea. Um, and uh, yeah, I think he also falls into the category of, you know, there's not much for me to, to participate in this conversation. Um, so yeah. Um, but the women in my family have been overly supportive and I think it just adds to my brand in a way, um, you know, the idea of women being there for each other, women supporting each other throughout my entire life. I think it's the women who have lifted me up uh, when I've had challenges or when I felt down or low because a woman can really relate. Um, so yeah, it's been, that's been a really great uh, learning um, so in fact this goes the other way to most of the conversations that we have where it's like the elder women in the family and things the way they've been coming along you don't talk about certain topics and you know it's it's just something that happens in families also going back to the boarding school point the three of us all, all of us are from boarding schools in three different countries and in three different types of boarding schools Akhil, Akhil was in a military kind of a school in Sanar you went to an all girls school in uh in the US and I was in Singapore I think uh, the advantage with a UWC and a Singapore for me was as Akhil was saying you know with, when you're confined and Singapore is such a safe place that way like there was no there was never a thing that you know oh yeah you know this, there's going to be some kind of crime you can't stay out late and I think that was a real bonus but also coming back to family and coming back to the women in your family you know 
for you you don't even have to just deal with your own family you also you're married so there's your that side of the family as well how was that whole thing about like you know cuz women working and like you know how is that whole thing what was that conversation like was it even a conversation it wasn't to be honest i think the what makes it hard is the living in two countries living between hong kong and bombay uh, i think that's what makes it challenging but besides that it was really not a conversation my husband is super supportive of what i'm doing he really believes in what i'm doing um and uh you know after i've been i've only been married less than 6 months but after getting married i have way more respect for married women because um married women especially in today's generation where you know it's the norm for a woman to work um to manage work as well as to manage family to juggle the two um i don't i don't have kids of my own yet but when i see women who have kids and they work it just blows my mind um because you know and i have a newfound respect for women if that was even possible um just to see the the amount that they juggle you know um they're always on the lookout for others uh they're always on the lookout for the family so they take that pressure and they take that responsibility upon themselves and then you add a layer of work um and work responsibility to that as well um and it's pretty amazing really so honestly i the reason i asked you this because i mean i thought about it three or four times before even thinking of asking you this cuz according to me in an ideal world this conversation isn't one that needs to be had you know you are working your partner is working or they're not whatever to each their own right you have that conversation amongst yourselves and you go on with it that i think the fact that we even have to think about this that okay yeah you were you're married and you have kids and how are you going to deal with that and is the family going to be okay i think that is a type i mean is something in, that we've left behind in the past so it's so nice to hear that you have come across an environment where it's not something that is even questioned or you know it's something that's understood and supported because i think the support of family is very very important that's another theme that we've noticed so you said your the women in your family were very supportive your husband has been very supportive can you list a couple of, i mean can you sort of point out a couple of occasions where they have been or their where their support has taken you that extra mile um with my husband he is really my sponge so when i you know and being an entrepreneur can be a really frustrating and emotionally taxing experience so he's the first person i call when i'm i'm just hitting the wall um and he's always there to lift me up you know um my nani has been a huge supporter um she just thinks the product is great and very much needed in the world um and then you know support is also very much so in 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 the positive feedback that we get when a friend or a customer messages messages us and says that they love the product that is to be honest the biggest support that i can get because then i know what i'm doing is working and it gives it feels like this this purpose in it you know um in the day in and day out of work first of all time flies by like this you know you don't know where your day has gone um and you sometimes very often forget why you're also doing this you know cuz just one task after another um you forget the purpose so when we get messages like this it's the biggest booster really so avisha another thing uh, in addition to the boosters you've been a sort of booster to us because you were our first uh, cold outreach as such you were the first person i sort of reached out to just i was seeing you on instagram and uh, You know, I remember telling Akhil about this. I was like, "Hey, dude, guess what? I reached out to someone on Inst. I mean, I reached out to a brand on Instagram, where I don't know who this person is. We have a couple of mutual followers, so that may work in my favor. But apart from that, I don't know who you are. You don't know who I am. You don't know who the Thought Bistro is. And let's see what happens. <laughs> It's totally my pleasure. I'm, I'm honestly honored to have been, you know, uh, found on Instagram and. Um, you know it's 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 a two way it's a two way street on a plane i think it's helped in us furthering our cause of creating value and you know finding people who think in ways of you know leaving the world a better place than we found it so we have this you know ongoing thing that you know, we want to try and create as much value as we can so 
like you know that 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 works in our favor and as you said it's a two way street that has to work you know you the response from you was re- i mean really nice and i really appreciate how you were such a sport about being like yeah sure let's get on call and let's you know let's take it from there and i think what 10 days later we're recording yeah <laughs> You're an absolute sport for doing that. Yeah. Like it's not easy just connecting with random strangers and being like, okay, I'm going to be on your podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for coming on and being such a sport. So what? Let me now switch the the question um, and see what caused what got you guys to start this, um, and uh, you know what what is the your vision for this podcast? The vision is we want to connect to. 150 founders a year so in 2 years time when we have over 300 founders associated with us we would like to be in a position where if someone comes to us and tells us hey i would like to start a business in women's health and period products and you know something around this we are like yeah we have avisha we have anahat we have the pink box we have a bunch of others we know what you guys want so we understand your pain points your needs and we are able to identify a sort of hole in the industry rather than being like oh you know yeah i just start up another generic brand which does stuff that's already happening we can identify what you guys all collectively need and help that person find a solution which fills up that hole so they're in creating value for them creating value for you guys and then creating value all around we really wish to connect all of our founders together and you know build everybody's business together hopefully we can connect you to like a lot of businesses and maybe a lot of our viewers eventually which will increase so vishra and i we came across this book called the theory of constraints and in the theory of constraints the thing is one thing holds back your business if you expand on that one thing suddenly your business you know grows multifold and then a next thing will hold back your business so a constraint is good in the sense that that is the thing you need to focus on in order to we be blast off right sure and it'll keep you growing as well exactly so what we thought is that we'll install sensors in different kind of manufacturing units and we'll come up with what their constraints are and then build a business around that so when we came across that we thought that sensors will be very expensive so what is easier to do is just straight up ask the founders So now we straight up ask the founders what exactly do you need in your business and then we come up with other founders who will fulfill their exact needs right and if tomorrow somebody wishes to be a founder and let's say you require something very special for one of the layers in the underwear and you wish to source that you come up you come to us and be like can you source that for us and we'll find someone who will source it or we'll get it to you right so the that is the vision I don't know how real it is, but we are trying to make it very real. We are talking to a lot of incredible people like yourself. Kind of like um, like a virtual co-working space in a sense, a virtual community. Community co-working space, brand managers, incubators, accelerators. <laughs> I think <laughs> we have used a whole range of terms, and I think as and how we go on, that that list of terms will keep growing. But uh, I think. basically the fun for us lies in creating value i think both of us thrive on finding ways to create value and you know exploring different avenues and uh, that's what we're trying to maximize through this so and and also we really want to learn i think the amount i have learned about women's health in the past 3 days and the amount i have spoken about menstruation and periods and period products and disposal of period products i think is not something that i have ever done before So yeah I think the learning is so beautiful because you're learning about so many different industries so many different founders so many lovely stories yeah great it is a very selfish endeavor because you know there's a thing called the five chimps theory that your personality is built around the five people that you hang out with consistently for us those other three people keep switching based on who the founders are or who the co-founders are and continuously being pumped with the idea of business needs values community what is happening what is happening right we might be able to evolve ourselves in a better manner so that's also the hope out of it entrepreneurial journey is as much personal as it is professional and i think that's what makes it super interesting because your two worlds are 
so woven so closely um, together. Um, and uh, yeah, that's what I'm experiencing every day. It's your baby. It's at the end of the day, what you're doing is your baby. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes a priority in your life. Um, you never thought, you know, work could be have so much significance. Um, but everything starts making sense, you know, when you come across those people and they just can't stop talking about work. That starts to make sense and I can start to relate to that, you know. Um, so, yeah. Lovely, Avisha. So, I think we're going to just about bring this to a close. So, we have this tradition on our podcast where our previous guest has left a question for you. And we would like you to answer that question and leave a question for the upcoming guest. The question for you is, uh, what kind of premium do you assign to a human over a machine to call yourself a social organization? I think it's contributing to society. You know, you would value the human doing, like, um, doing the work instead of machine. Um, as a way of being able to contribute to society, contribute to um, unemployment uh, percentages, um, and you know, in a in a sense, also giving back um, and do it playing your part. Interesting. Can we have your question? Okay, I need to have a think for a second. <laughs> 